All righty, so welcome everybody. Uh, good evening, welcome to another AB 617 South Sacramento Floor and Steering Committee meeting. Um, I just wanna let everybody know that this meeting is being recorded and it'll be posted on the district website and our YouTube channel. So with that, I'll pass it to the co-leads. Good evening, everyone. And as always, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us. This is an important conversation and this meeting uh, this evening should be very educational. Uh, we will do a roll call of steering committee members. All right. Go ahead. I'll do that for you. Uh, Bill Milton. Yes, ma'am. Bishop Chris Baker. Here. Gary Johansson. Here. Rhonda Henderson. Here. Stephanie Williams. Present. Tito Huang. Here. Vincent Valdez. Here. Jesus Cervantes. Here. Hien Chen. Here. John Rice. Hasn't joined us yet. Steve Blanton. They haven't joined us yet. We do have a quorum. Perfect. Janice, would you do, or Marina, would you do uh, staff facilitator and CARB roll call? Yes, sir. So district staff, Dr. Roberto Yala. Hi, everybody. Good to be here. Mark Lotzenheiser. Here, thank you. Amy Roberts. Good evening, I'm here, thanks. Jaime Limos. Good evening, everybody. Janice Lam Snyder. Here, good, good evening. David Yang. Hello, everybody, I'm here. Rafe Porter. Good evening, everyone. All right, and for CARB staff, Karen Buckley. Hi, everyone, I'm Dildy Reyes. I'm here for Karen tonight. David Ridley. And Trish Johnson. Hello, this is Trish. Hi, Trish. Hi. And facilitator Ariel Amberster. Hi, I'm here. Okay, with that, we're you ready to review the agenda. Okay, welcome everyone. So after uh, offering you a little bit of information about the webinar, we'll move to a district update, then a recap discussion on land use and air quality uh, issues. And then we will hear from the outreach subgroup and we'll consider their recommendations on outreach. After that, at 7 to 7.40 p.m., we're looking at an air monitoring data uh, report out on the uh, monitoring information from um, the phase two part of monitoring and a discussion um, to help ground the steering committee on its future decision on where to locate the phase three monitoring trailer. Then we'll move to new business and future agenda topics. And then we'll have the general uh, public comment time where members of the public have an opportunity to make comments on items that aren't on the agenda and then adjourn at 8 p.m. And just a quick reminder on the code of conduct. So members agree that they'll treat everybody with courtesy and respect. They'll avoid personal attacks or demeaning anyone. Uh, also avoid interrupting others who have the floor or disrupting or delaying the meeting. They'll strive to be fair and unbiased towards each other, the public and the air district. They'll value each other's time, respect each other's opportunity to speak and strive to reach consensus. If they're not able to, they will agree to disagree if need be and listen courteously and attentively to the public and strive to, up, to hold each other accountable to the code of conduct. 
Okay, with that, I think it's back to Marina. Yes, can we get the uh, logistics slide up? Perfect. I'm gonna run through some logistics for us. Um, we have staff available for you. If you have any technology issues, send an email to ab617clerk at airquality.org and someone will contact you. You can also in the chat box message the host or co-host if you're having any technical trouble. Um, for agenda items that have steering committee discussion, the co-leads will announce the format of the discussion. So if it's round robin, the co-leads will call upon each member one by one to speak. And then after each member has spoken, you're welcome to raise your virtual hand if you have any additional comments or questions for the public comment period and any discussion that is not round robin. If you'd like to speak, please just raise your virtual hand. Uh, in order to do so, it'll depend on the version of Zoom that you're using. If you're on the computer and you have an older version of Zoom, you can click on the participant icon on the bottom of the screen, and then you'll get a pop-up panel with all of the participants um, at the bottom of the panel, you should see a raise hand button. Or if you have newer version of Zoom, you can click on the reactions button and select raise hand. Um, and then you'll see a hand pop up next to your name and you'll know that your hand is raised. If you're calling in on the phone, you can press star nine and you'll hear an automatic voice saying that your hand is raised and that it worked. Uh, when you are called upon, please unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon on the lower left of the computer. And if you're on the phone, press star six. If you're using both the computer and telephone, you might have to unmute yourself on both. You can also email any comments to the same email, ab617clerk at airquality.org during the public comment period and we'll read it aloud. And a reminder for steering committee members, um, while it's nice to be able to see each other's faces, you are not required to have your camera turned on if you have any privacy concerns about your home being viewed publicly. Uh, the meetings are recorded and posted on the district's YouTube channel. So if you have any concerns about that, you're not obligated. And that is all of our logistics. I will pass it to the co-leads. Your minutes or summary was uh, sent out in your packet. We would entertain a motion to approve that summary. I approve. Bishop. Okay. Motion by Chris Baker. The second was, was that John Rice? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Welcome, John. We missed you on the first roll call. I, I've got you now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And there are a few other folks, I think, as well. Steve has joined as well. Steve Blanton. Are you present? I don't have him yet. We have a motion and a second on the table. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any uh, abstentions for absence? That would be me. Abstention. Is that Gary? Oh, uh, that was Vince Valdez. Oh, uh, Vincent. OK. Vincent. Okay. Are you abstaining from this vote? Yes. I haven't had a chance to look at anything. I just got in the door maybe you know, a few minutes okay. ago. Okay. Very good. And mine is for absence. And uh, chairs, my apology, I was looking at our member of the public, Stephen, uh, that would be Robert Blanton who's entered. Sorry about that, Robert. Okay. All right, motion carries. All right, Marina. District update. Yes, I have a quick um, update announcement for steering committee members. If you've not already submitted your annual required documents to please do so, I believe we're still waiting for three members to submit their documents. Uh, these include the participation agreement, conflict of interest form, and if you're eligible and um, choose to take the stipend, your stipend agreement form and payee data form. Uh, you may or may not need all of those forms I just said, depending on your situation. So please check back uh, to the original email that we sent and feel free to contact us and double check uh, which forms you need to submit. I, Brina, this is Steve. I believe I submitted everything. I don't know if you know offhand, but if uh, I, I could go back in the email file and look. Uh, I would need to check uh, to double, double check and make sure that yours are in, but I can let you know after the meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. No rush. May, may I ask that question? Yes, well, yeah, 
I can deliver my packet. I don't know if it was received or not. So let me put it this way. Marina, will you please um, send out an email to those whose information you have not received yet? If you yes. then receive an email tomorrow that it, your documents are not on in, you know that otherwise your documents have been received. Yes, perfect. I will look forward to your email, Mariana. <laughs> so can I also have a point of clarity? Uh, Steve, on your name, it says Robert Blanton. Is that your, like your real name and you go by Steve or what? How, do, how should we know how to handle that? Oh, I don't think he hear, heard me. Okay, well, we'll continue forward. Okay. Marina, go, take us away. Uh, that was all for my um, update on the required documents. I'll pass it to Amy for the uh, update on the SEP program. Hi, good, um, good evening, everyone. I'm Amy Roberts with the district and I'm a, a division manager for the stationary source division and that's our, our permitting and enforcement arm at the district. So I wanted to, um, I'm happy to be able to give you this information tonight on what's called supplemental environmental projects and a new program that we have developed just recently here at the district. Um, so I want to walk through some of the details with you, but we're going to be sending a full packet of information to you um, probably in the next couple of days. So look for that in the email um, and that will have a whole a whole bunch of um, different information that you can follow and, and we'll be happy to answer questions after um, this presentation or after this brief presentation of the details and at any time um, in the future too. Um, but in basically supplemental environmental projects. Uh, typically at the Air District, when we have violations of air quality regulations, there's a penalty associated with that. And uh, it's money based. So that uh, violator, in order to resolve the violation, pays the penalty. And uh, we basically inspire them to not uh, violate regula uh, our regulations in the future. Uh, this is different, uh, what we're doing right now. Uh, typically, we haven't had many supplemental environmental projects. Um, violators request to take some of that penalty money and put it towards a beneficial project. And like I said, um, not too many have requested that in the past, and it's just not um, something that's very common um, for air districts in general. Uh, so right now, we do have a couple of penalty amounts and violators that are interested in diverting up to 50% of their penalty amount towards a project. In order for us to do that fairly and in order for us to put that penalty money and fund projects in certain uh, priority areas, we put together this program. Um, so uh, what this program will do is basically allow uh, people to submit projects to us, excuse me, to us. We'll collect a list of those projects and then we'll let these, um, put these violators look through that list and select a project. Uh, there's going to be a solicitation period where we'll be accepting these applications from June 1st through July 30th. And um, we are very, um, we have specific guidelines. So there's um, people that can submit applications to us are going to be limited to uh, nonprofits, community-based organizations, tribal organizations, uh, colleges and universities. Um, so those types of groups. Um, we'll also have restrictions on where those projects uh, must take place. So the projects have to be completed in, um, like I said, district priority communities. And there's two areas that I wanna make sure that I highlight for you because we're focusing those funding um, and the funding to go to either two, two places, either um, this community, so specifically within the boundaries of, of this selected community, and then uh, projects can also be submitted that could be completed within um, what's called the sustainable communities map that SMUD puts together. And um, those are for any um, types of areas that are designated as medium to high priority. So we really wanted to focus dollars into certain areas in the region and, and not just anywhere. Uh, so that's an important point that I wanted to um, bring forward. Right now we have about $160,000 that uh, could go to projects. Um, again, I said, like I said, we have about a two month period where we will be collecting these projects, putting them together, and we'll look to fund projects in uh, late fall. 
Um, so if there's any questions that you have about supplemental environmental projects in themselves, um, the solicitation period, um, or any of the um, information that we're going to be sending to you, like I said, there's going to be full of guidelines, the application itself, um, but just wanted to get this in front of you so that you yourselves can consider um, uh, submitting an application or if you are um, participating in a, an organization that can do so, that you're aware of this opportunity. Thank you. Look, I look forward to getting that information and reviewing it. Thank you. All right. Um, at this point, Marita, um, we're going to uh, go ahead and uh, is it going to Mike uh, to Mark at this time for transitioning this? Sure, I'll just go ahead real quick. So, um, what was it? It's now been a couple of months ago. We did have the uh, city and county came and talked a little bit about the different planning elements. Right at the very beginning of that, we had Rafe of our of the Air District staff sort of give a little bit of a, a lead in. We originally had planned to have Rafe uh, sort of come back in and sort of bookend it, if you will, talk about how the district's role and all those pieces come together. Uh, we were just very busy in a lot of other great topics last month. Uh, so the committee had asked, we go ahead and uh, have Rafe come back this meeting just to, again, sort of bring back, um, just sort of to bookend, if you will, to tie in the pieces that the city and county shared, um, what the district's involved in, and just sort of lay that groundwork so the committee has the information as we move forward on next steps. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn over to Rafe to go ahead and share a little bit more about land use and the air quality impacts. Great, thanks Mark. Thanks uh, steering committee members. And um, Mark did a great job of, of uh, kind of giving you the background about why, why we're here. Um, when I was last here two months ago, talked a little bit about where emissions are coming from and how from a land use perspective, um, the, the district, the city, the county, and a lot of our partners um, tend to deal with or, or can deal with some of these, these issues. And, and this slide up here is just a reminder of where um, in, in a pie uh, those emissions are coming from. And so you can see that in our region, uh, most of those emissions are coming from, from the transportation sector, which obviously has a really big land use component. Uh, the, the more spread out we are, the further you have to drive and the less transportation alternatives there are. So we're gonna have more tailpipe emissions. And then from obviously the built environment from industry, residential, commercial, um, so forth. So this just gives you a sense of, of where um, in our region uh, emissions are coming from. So next slide, please. And how we think about um, reducing emissions or reducing the impacts from emissions, uh, we really think of, of two different ways that we can do that. We can lower the emissions at the source. So again, if it's that transportation sector slice of the pie, we think about how we, how we reduce that right out of the tailpipe or we can reduce exposure to those emissions. So if those emissions are gonna to continue to happen, how do we make sure that that impact to people and businesses um, living and working and playing in that area are reduced in some um, substantial way? So next slide, please. There's several roles that uh, land use can, can play in this and whether no matter what part of that um, slice of the pie you're at, land use does have a substantial role. And then the Air District and our partners, again, the city, county, SACOG, SMUD, um, they all play a role in that as well. And the Air District works um, doing some of the, the, the things that we do on our own, but, but largely in partnership with some of these, these agencies. And so I put together a couple of tables to, to look at those two pieces that we would go with, those two paths, lowering the emissions at the source and reducing the um, exposure to those to try to reduce the impacts. The column on the left is really just looking at, again, what is the source and its vehicle trips and cleaner vehicles and how could we potentially reduce those emissions at the source? And then we start to get into what is the land use role in that? So as you can see on the vehicle, on the vehicle side, we're really just trying to get people to think a little bit differently about um, the types of trips they take, where they're going and, and how, how, do you, how do you, the air district or the city or the county 
start to work at that and it gets the, you start to move down the columns on the side. So in that first one, it's really looking at the infrastructure. So we can start to look at transit and, and how do we um, make a, a taking other modes of transportation that much easier. Then we start to move to, to shorter vehicle trips. So first we're taking fewer trips by taking different modes of transportation. Then there's gonna be um, a leftover trips and how do you make those a little bit shorter? Obviously this has a really big land use component to it. Or you're just trying to put those uses closer together. So this is things like street design and, and, your, and your development patterns. Uh, and then you get to, you reduce the total amount of trips that you possibly can, and then you wanna clean up the remaining trips. And that's just really looking at vehicle technology and getting cleaner vehicles. Um, on the land use side, this is making sure that we plan the infrastructure in the most efficient and effective way we can. So where do we place EV chargers and hydrogen fueling stations? And again, how are we lowering those emissions from, from that vehicle? But then you also have that on the built environment side. So building efficiency and cleaner operations have a big part of that too. And so the Air District, again, works internally and externally on trying to look at different technologies that can, that can reduce that at the source. Uh, next slide, please. And then the other side of that equation is obviously there are going to be some, well, we're trying to work and, and reducing the amount of emissions that we possibly can and mitigating those where we can, uh, but there are going to be some emissions. And so the other thing that we're trying to do is just reducing the exposure to that. Um, so if you are gonna have a great um, transportation network that's full of bic bicycle lanes and, and sidewalks and things like that, how can you do that in a way that's reducing the exposure to those emissions? So there's really three kind of chunks that we look at that. You can look at the source and, and where is that source placed? You can look at who's being exposed to that and, and try to see how you can move them, or you can just simply block the exposure. And land use obviously plays a big role in all, in, in all of those. Um, moving the source is not only looking at existing sources, obviously future sources as well. If you've got an existing neighborhood, you might not want to plunk down a big industrial um, facility right next to it. And so this is obviously zoning and, and how you deal with land use. And so we're trying to require, or not require, but encourage um, the people that we work with, again, the cities and counties and, and some of our partners and thinking about how they might be exposing people to emissions if they place things in a certain way. The next is moving people. This is not only just saying, let's move a neighborhood somewhere else, but it's maybe moving how they might even move around. So I've got sidewalks and bike lanes and things like that on here. So a lot of places don't even have sidewalks. So you're putting people right next to the traffic. And obviously that's only a, not only a safety concern, but obviously exposes them to those emissions as well. Um, so if you move them, build a bike lane, have on-street parking, have shade trees, things like that, it removes them further away from that source of emissions. It also just makes it a lot more pleasant and a higher quality of life. And then the last one is, is um, blocking that exposure. And this much like the moving people and the things I talked about is more from a design standpoint. So how do we think about when we're designing a neighborhood or designing even just a street, what are the elements that we want to put into that? Again, you can do a lot of the things um, like up above, like sidewalks and, and bike lanes, but also trees and shade trees and things like that. So how do you block that exposure? So the Air District has done quite a bit of this already. Um, and I sent some slides in kind of late, so I'm not sure if they made it. So let's go to the next slide and see if those got in there. Oh, yeah, there we go. Sorry, I think I jumped ahead. Um, so this is an example um, actually from the AB617 community. Um, this is on the corner of Sheldon and, and I, I think it's Frisia, if I'm saying that, that correctly, in Elk Grove. Um, so the picture on the left is a picture of a bus stop in um, 2017 looks really inviting, right? On a really hot day, who wants to be sitting under that thing? Or at nighttime when there's no lights, who wants to be sitting there waiting for a bus? Um, so we put together a, a, a program um, called TGIF, which is basically green infrastructure financing. So providing ways for people and, and cities and jurisdictions to um, talk about and, and do some of these projects that, that I mentioned before. So on the right is a covered shaded uh, bus stop that we put in there that has solar panels for lights underneath. So not only on those hot summer days is it a little bit more pleasant to go there, um, but we're, we also made it um, so that there's light. So it's a little bit safer in the evenings as well. Obviously there's probably some more things that could be done here, but this is just a great example of how just- There we go, great. Rafe, go ahead. And just to note too, Chris Baker has his hand up when we get to that point. Go ahead. Okay, Rafe. great. Thank you. Um, if, you if we could go back one slide, because I did, I did jump ahead and I, I apologize. 
Um, and so from that lowering, um, again, kind of the whole thing, uh, reducing the emissions at the source and then lowering the exposure to that. This is just kind of the universe of everything that I talked about. The things that I have highlighted um, in yellow are some of the things that we're doing already. Uh, again, we're working with a lot of our partners to make sure that we've got good access to transit. Um, the Air District oversees some carpool um, and, and car share um, operations. We work quite a bit um, with different people to create mobility hubs. And I know we're looking at some in the AB 617 community as well. Um, on the cleaner vehicle side, obviously we do a lot on the heavy, medium and light duty side and trying to get new technologies. Um, and we're, we're starting to uh, branch a lot more into the infrastructure piece of that as well. So providing charging infrastructure and hydrogen fueling stations. And then we're also trying to work with um, our partners as well as the state and trying to get a little bit of flexibility on some of the things that we can do. And that's what I've highlighted there in the green. So some of the projects that I, I showed you, um, like the, the shaded bus stop, for example, are some of the things that we're looking to do with some of our funds. So the things highlighted in yellow are the things that we can do. And the things in the green are things that we're trying to say to the state of, hey, there's some great reasons to do this from a air quality perspective and a health perspective, and also an equity perspective in some of our communities. So let's try to get some flexibility in some of our funds to do this. Uh, and then I was gonna talk about the bus stop, <laughs> but you've already seen that. So I will go ahead and, and stop there. I think that's the end of my presentation and see if there's any questions or comments. Thank you. So Chris had had his hand raised and then Vincent is after Chris. Go ahead, Chris. All right, on the, um, where am I at here? Oh, average trip. Can you tell me what does it mean by roll? Do we roll down the street or? <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so almost almost more, more popular than than things like transit and and car share and bike share or, or is bike share and scooter share so the 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 shareables kind of fall into a couple of categories and 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 the term du jour right now is is rolling so so it's it's usually biking and and scooter share and things like that so that's what they call it so God, is that for, for catching that <laughs> I thought you meant we just get a little uh, blanket or something and just say someone pushes down the street till we get to our destination. Well, that might work too. That sounds good to me. <laughs> but thank you for catching that. I appreciate it. Go ahead, Vincent. And then he and yes, uh, Thanks, Rafe. That was a great uh, report. I was looking at some of the slides and, uh, and I was trying to take notes as you we, we were talking, but uh, in the building efficiency, there was no solar mentioned on how we could make the buildings a little more efficient. And I don't know if we support solar here or we're just looking at clean vehicles and vehicle emission, but I think that's a, just something that could be on the list of Absolutely. things that that's, we want to look for. Yeah, and that's, that's, one of, that's one of the ones that we're gonna work with a lot of our partners on, especially the folks over at SMUD who have a lot of incentives there. Um, we're gonna work with them. Obviously, there's a big piece going in this week about building electrification and the ordinances the city's putting forward. So we are, you're absolutely right. It is definitely one of those that at the point, um, looking at how we reduce that and putting rooftop solar in other ways is a great way to do that. Um, unfortunately, we, again, we don't have um, the resources with our own funds out of, out of our division uh, to do that at the Air District, but we will definitely work with the cities and counties and our partners like SMUD to make sure that some of those um, um, are brought forward. Uh, that leads into one of my other questions is whether or not do we as a committee have a letter or, or the ability to, ability to support issues like that that are coming up in front of the city council and the, and the county councils as well. So just curious, uh, and we can answer that later. Um, so I, I'm happy to answer that one now, if, if you don't mind. I think that's sure. one of the great powers of this committee is being able to work with some of those partners. And that's almost one of the strongest land use um, plays that you as a committee can make um, as individuals, obviously, as well. But I think as a committee, definitely weighing in on some of those, those larger land use issues is, is a great way to go. Great. Thanks for answering that. Maybe we'll, we'll have to figure out a way we can get some, something like that. And, and support some of these local issues as well. So uh, just on Florin Road, you know, the, the, uh, the land use and I know the permits, we talked about how long they take. And, and, and so I'm just, I, I was looking at, you know, the food desert on Florin Road, just uh, 
east or west, yeah, east of uh, 99. And so there's a new AMPM going up there. And so I did map it out. So within a quarter mile, there's another gas station. Within 0.7 miles, there's two more gas stations on the other side of the freeway. And then within one mile, there's another eight super AMPM. And so maybe these are the land use ideas that we could maybe support as a committee that, you know, instead of more gas stations, maybe we can get some uh, food markets that people can buy local. And, and so that's the reducing of uh, travel that, yep. that we're talking about. And those are just, you know, habits that are, are hard to break. But I, I just know there's so many gas stations right there. And that's all we needed right in front of Burlington Coat Factory is a super AM, PM, 24 hour gas station where everybody can shop and get junk food. So, um, yeah, that, diver that diversity of uses is, is key. I mean, if you've got so many of the same uses in a particular area, it's, you know, you, you've, you've, you don't have that, um, mix of uses that, that, um, reduce and, and lower the, the distance of those trips. So you're, um, Vincent, you're, you're spot on. And then the last thing, just for the design in case we could, there's no sidewalks on the, uh, on the north side of the Mac Road overpass. And so I don't know how people are gonna walk across. I mean, I, I, I maneuvered it with my son last year and it was, it was fun for him to see that. <laughs> but scary, I'm sure as well. Yeah, it was a little scary, a little hairy, you know, going on the on-ramp and uh, off-ramp there. And also, can we get a map of all 11 uh, bus shelters that we're proposing to put in? Uh, yeah, yep. Um, all of those have been funded and, and, and um, implemented, but we can definitely get those out to the, to the committee. Okay, so the committee didn't have an input on those, or did we? Unfortunately, did that I... kind of unfortunately not that predated the that predated the committee. But um, if as we get more flexibility in our funds, um, we definitely want to work with the committee on on how best we use those. Okay, thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, thanks, Vincent. So we have. I got um, a question. Um, yeah. Well, um, he in is, and then and then I think Chris, did you have your hand raised again? Yeah. Right. Okay. And then Chris, and then Jesus, did you did you just have a question about this item that they were just discussing? Yes. Well, actually, okay, yes. Great. It's related to the bus so, stops. So okay. Let, let's let he go next, then Jesus, and then we'll come back to Chris again. Great. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Rafe. Um, I have a few questions. One of uh, which is, um, I I know roundabouts. The use of roundabouts are kind of more prominent in the East Coast. And um, not only does it help, not only does it encourage a flow of traffic, it also helps to reduce fuel consumption um, in new road building or repairs. Is that part of, is that considered as an option too? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's one that we would likely work with, again, some of our partners. Um, so this, the two cities, uh, the county, as well as SACOG, who um, funds a lot of those projects. Um, I, you know, roundabouts, is, is, as you mentioned, is great for traffic calming. Um, it does keep traffic flowing a little bit as well, which produces emissions. Um, and there's a big safety component to it as well. So um, I know that the county right now is actually going through an active transportation planning effort. That might be a good opportunity to provide some input on that. And I can send that link around um, to, to the steering committee. So that's a good opportunity on the county side of where to put things in. They're obviously going through their general plan and things like that. But those are a little bit broader, but that active transportation plan would be a good opportunity to speak about something specifically like that. Thank you. I'm glad yeah. that's considered as an option. Um, the I think in, in tying with what uh, Amy had just earlier presented, um, is there kind of a move to incentivize um, incentivize business owners or potential business owners to uh, you know uh, work with new older buildings, vacant buildings and revitalize areas that are kind of deserted versus new builds. Um, just because, you know, just working with what we have rather than contributing more to the admissions and uh, that way. Yeah, I think, um, again, I think from a regional perspective, absolutely, um, you know, whenever there's a big general plan or, or a large scale plan, um, uh, revitalization and using existing infrastructure is a big component to that. It obviously, re like you mentioned, reduces the, the amount of trips and the, the length of, this, of those trips. Um, it's just also a big economic component to it as well. Um, so, so absolutely, 
Um, and, and Bill can probably speak to this a little bit more than I, but sometimes that's a little bit harder to get you know, existing property owners to, to, to sink some money into that. So um, working with, uh, and, and there's a big component that the state took away from a lot of the cities and counties recently, which was the loss of redevelopment, which really hurt. Um, a lot of that. So a lot of those older buildings that, you know, with, with redevelopment could have been revitalized has, has gone away. But um, through the cities and the county economic development departments, I think there's the potential to, to look at what are some of the resources that can be made available. Thanks so much, Rafe. It helps to just know what sustainability work is out there. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Pat, you are muted. Hey, Jesus, you had a question? Yeah, very quick. Uh, thank you, Rob, for the presentation. I really enjoy it. I got a question. Uh, it's about the uh, bus stops. I can see that there is a big difference between the ones that you are working and the ones that we have in South Sacramento. My question is, uh, unfortunately, on Florida Road and Franklin Boulevard, I don't see any bus stop that, you know, is as pretty as the ones that you are kind of as you know, uh, demonstrating in your presentation. So the question is that are you guys planning to kind of also implement that in South Sacramento area? Yep, um, absolutely. That's some of the, the flexibility that we're looking for. So some of those green highlighted things on that mm -hmm. table, which are things like the bus stop and, and bike lanes and sidewalks, as Vin, um, Vincent mentioned, uh, are, are missing in some of the areas. That's definitely something that we would want to start to target in these areas if we get that flexibility. Um, there are some other potential to, to, to get some other funds and that we could do some of those things, but if we get that flexibility and, and maybe this is a, a good time to, you know, um, you know, reach out to the steering committee and, and ask for support on, on this flexibility that we're looking for, um, to, to help do some of those projects. So absolutely. That's, that's definitely where we want to target and the types of projects we want to do. That would be awesome. Thank you very much. You bet. Um, and it <clears throat> having participated, if I might interject, uh, having participated in that particular bus stop that you showed uh, uh, project, uh, that is in the city of Elk Grove. The city of Elk Grove is still building shelters. The city of Sacramento and the county of Sacramento were eliminating shelters. Um, so, and there, a lot of their concern was around the issue of homeless folks, mm -hmm. those shelters. Um, and so th there's, a, there's a, a push and a pull uh, because you are not going to have people standing in hot sun, boiling sun, waiting for a bus as opposed to using a car if they can't be sheltered from the rain and they can't get some protection uh, by tree or otherwise for some shade. Th those are issues that we need to bring forward. Um, and those happen, unfortunately, those issues happen to South Sacramento and, uh, and highly impacted communities. We are perceived as not uh, needing shade or shelter because of who we are. And uh, we have to rebrand that uh, uh, thought process in our elected officials. Absolutely. All right, uh, time check. We are uh, we are out of time. Uh, and uh, Bishop Chris, I know you wanted to come back to a question. Would you please put it in the chat or forward it to uh, Rafe so that he can be able to answer that question? The same with Vincent. If you had a second question, can you forward that to Rafe? Yes. No, I will not, ma'am. <laughs> Always a rebel. Always a rebel. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can do that. I can do that. All right. Thank you so very much uh, so that we can stay on schedule. Um, okay. We have Thanks, an important outreach report coming. Uh, Thank you, Rick. Good time. And okay. You ready for me? <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, Rhonda, uh, before you do a report back, uh, this is the second report back coming from the outreach subgroup. I wanted to thank you for uh, leading this group and for all of the participants, uh, both uh, members and members of the public who have participated and given feedback. So Rhonda Henderson, 
uh, please, if you will, lead us through right. the report. Well, thank you. And, and I'd like to diddle that. I'd like to thank the participants on this subcommittee uh, for working together to pull together this list of recommendations. Um, in your, and I guess, is it a PowerPoint or in the handouts? I guess it's in the handouts. You'll see a, a three page or four page handout that says final outreach recommendations to steering committee. There, there it is, okay. And we came up with our top five recommendations. And um, the other handout shows the criteria and the definitions on our thought process. Um, so the other handout would give you like our definition key on what, what, what do we mean when we say who, what, when, where, why, and how. And then also um, we looked at low hanging fruit for methods used. And we looked at no cost, low cost, moderate cost. Okay, so I'm gonna move into the five. We have five, one of them is, is public feedback and awareness campaign. And you can see the who um, would be the prioritized groups that we identified previously. Um, well, neighborhood just a second, Rhonda, whoever has the screen, can you please enlarge that so that we can read that more easily? Thank you. And if you can fit to width, that might work. Uh, there, there, perfect. There. Okay, that's okay. better. All Thank right. you, Rhonda. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, we did it based on the, the five W's plus H for how. So if you look at each one, it's gonna tell you who our audience is or our targeted group or person. It's gonna tell you what we plan to say to them or do. Um, it looks like I have two what's there and what we want we, and why. That probably should be a, let me see, what we, um, what we wanna hear. We wanna hear from them and we wanna conduct surveys to hear various groups and, and we wanna do it by feedback surveys, awareness surveys, and offer some type of incentive to complete the surveys or some type of a gift, okay? Um, we wanna invite residents to air quality meetings to get results of surveys and discuss how to use information or data um, that we receive um, or post it on our new website. And we'll get to that in a minute. We're proposing a, a website. And then when um, we can establish this, a date for this, after surveys have been designed. Okay, and then where, we would start with priority uh, one group and then work our way through the other priority groups the same way. Okay, so now I'm gonna go to number two. The next one is wildfire, um, smoke awareness and safety campaign. We selected this one because it's, a, it's one that we could do right now because we're, we're already in the wildfire smoke uh, alert season. And so this is something that we could probably wrap it up quickly and, and, and notify whoever our target groups are. So we said our, our, we would notify the parents um, of school age children, junior high and college students located in the, in the defined area and also organize sports organizations such as coaches in high schools and college and little league soccer cheerleader, et cetera. And what we would do with them, what we would share would be, we would share information about the side effects to people when air quality is poor because of wildfires. We share multiple reliable sources that document um, the impact, the negative impact um, to our health. Uh, we provide uh, smoke awareness, wildfire smoke awareness information and tips. Um, we would also share relevant results from data from our monitors, if any. And then we would do this as soon as possible because we're right into the, the beginning of the season. Actually, it started early for wildfires. And how we would do this, we would contact the following organizations to conduct email blasts and utilize their mail email contact list and newsletters to assimilate the information to the groups that are listed there. Um, one of the groups is Elk Grove and Sacramento City Unified School District uh, liaison for, in their communication departments and also Consumers River College Sports Department and coaches. The next one is three, multimedia campaign. Let me see, let me find. 
Okay, so the multimedia campaign, we would like to, um, we're trying to reach out to um, existing media like Good Morning Sacramento, uh, other TV news shows that already may have an air quality segment. So we wanna partner with uh, Spare the Air Group Steering Committee web, uh, website. We wanna build a new website just for our steering committee so it makes it easier to find information. And, um, other TV stations and local radio stations. And so what would we be saying here? We wanna appear, actually have one of our members appear on the Good Morning Americans, um, Good Morning Sacramento, I guess it's called show. They have a, seg a segment for air quality already. So that, that would be good if we could be a guest on there just, just to heighten the awareness and provide tips. Um, prepare, we could prepare public service announcements to get our message out. Formalize hashtag with a Spare the Air group to start trends. Create iPods, create a website for our group and live stream steering committee meetings. So that's number three. Number four um, would be request for an RFP. One of the concerns we had when we met was it's very hard to figure out how you're gonna do outreach if you don't know what your budget is. So, so it, it almost kind of shut us down, but then we decided, well, let's look at no cost, low cost, moderate cost, and just let's, let's ask for it, okay? So we brought in some tips about that, but we would like to, um, request that the air quality or whoever we need to contact, that would be who our who is. We're not sure if it's the air quality district or whoever it is who has the funds. And then the what is, give us the funds to support solutions and incentives and gifts. And hire a communication firm to develop and implement short-term and long-term solution-based strategies to reach community. And we, we, the timing would be as soon as possible so subcommittee would know how to proceed from here and why to increase our outreach and survey efforts, efforts and how we would do this in person um, requests or in writing. And then the last one is five, community engagement campaign. And that's uh, our who we would contact would be the Air Quality District and Steering Committee. And what we would wanna say is we would like to offer hybrid meetings uh, where we would live stream the meetings on Facebook, um, or YouTube, as, as well as have an um, in-person meeting where you can social distance people for those who wanna be in person for the meeting so that we can provide um, uh, leaders a small stipend maybe to attend the steering committee meetings as some other groups do. And when we wanna do this, as soon as we can make, the district can make this happen. And where, okay, would be air quality decision maker and selected meeting space owner. So we have to, we have to figure out where we're gonna meet to do that. And then why we wanna do this because we wanna increase community stakeholders awareness and involvement. We wanna get more community people involved in the decision and get their ideas about solutions to air quality concerns in their neighborhoods instead of telling them what we think the problems are and what we think the solutions should be. And how we would do that, we would solicit help from the steering committee members or hire professionals to set up live stream meetings on Facebook and or YouTube. We, we would select a meeting site for the steering committee where there's room enough for, to allow for social distancing for the committee members and people from the public. And we would also require general public to register to attend these meetings so that we could make sure we don't overcrowd the room based on social distancing guidelines. So those are our five recommendations. Um, I don't know if you wanna have a motion on how you wanna prioritize these, which ones you wanna start first, or do you wanna tackle all of them? So I, I would um, ask the question of the, of the committee. Well, let, let's, uh, let's open up the discussion so that we can um, look at these. Did everyone get this in their packet? All yes. Right. So as you start to review uh, those, what are some of the questions you have or observations that you have about the work uh, that the subcommittee had? And I see a hand from Stephanie Williams. Let's start with you, Stephanie, followed by Vincent. Uh, not a question, but more just so just a comment on the presentation and all the information that, um, that this uh, group did. I think it was really great. 
Um, I just wanted just to uh, say that I think that the idea um, in and around Good Day Sacramento is really, you know, I think that's really great. Um, I just recently participated in a group who had just a small, um, uh, they just had a small group of people for a particular project. And about two or three weeks ago, they did a brief segment on Good Day Sacramento, and that thing has tripled and quadrupled since then. And mm -hmm. so um, it didn't cost them anything, but it was a great um, way to advertise. And um, that particular group just has been booming um, with, uh, with interest and support. So I just wanted to say great job on that, uh, Rhonda. And, and as by way of priority, I would like to see um, um, especially that one to be moved kind of up. That's my comment. All right, thank you. All right, uh, Vincent Valdez, followed by uh, Ian Chen. Yes, uh, thank you, Rhonda, for uh, getting all the notes and, and, and bringing it nice and clear for everybody to see. And, and I appreciate when you, you said, uh, what funds do we have? And so that was the topic at our steering outreach committee. And, and I know the last time we talked about funding, it was the uh, state budget was uh, bleak and uh, uh, the pandemic was in the middle of all of it. And so, and we all know that the budget has changed since then and, and things are looking good for the state. I don't, I don't know how, we haven't been informed how that's impacted the AB 617 steering committee or anything like that. So that's why we had a question. We don't know if there's any money because we didn't even have enough money for meetings uh, when we talked about it last time. So it sounds like it's changed, but that's again, the. Uh, 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 sometimes it'd be good if we knew what we were working with prior to going into uh, talking about what we can do. Um, so the other thing was when we were trying to uh, empower the community to, community to participate in what we're doing uh, was, is it possible if we can get the Zoom link, Zoom link forwarded to us a month before our meeting? That way we could put it to different uh, uh, community calendars and also I sent it out to a couple of friends tonight, you know, cause I just, I was late on looking at my emails and I know I got it last week, but I, I guess I didn't include a few people. So it's just a month in advance. So, cause everybody's community calendar starts a month in advance. And I, these think these meetings should be scheduled now in advance. I, I know in the past we were looking for different locations and we didn't have all of our locations. And that was one of the problems we had, but so that, that's just one way to include the community and also, um, and uh, we, we talked about having a designated website and I, I don't think Rhonda uh, mentioned it. I know it's in one of our- uh, Yeah, I did. Uh, That's the yeah, new website. So, mm -hmm. so we all talked about in our outreach committee of how difficult it is to maneuver in the Air District website. I mean, and so we don't know if, if, if we have enough funds to create our own little web link and then so our own page. So somebody just click and it goes right to us instead of going to the air district, then we have to scroll through all these different sides and slides. And so I understand that you guys have your, your, your uh, web page and, and, it, and it's very informative, but it's very difficult for the, the community and some of the steering committee members as well, just to find our information on there. So those are the things and comments I had. Thank you. That's a, it's under um, multimedia, uh, Vincent, creating a new website for the steering committee. Yep, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vincent. He and Chad followed by uh, Steve Blanton. Yeah, so I just wanted to add a few comments and um, uh, with just for some content, I, I think a missing, maybe a missing component might be um, offering um, support in the languages that our communities speak um, at various events online, just translation, just so that um, we can have farther reach. Um, and Zoom, there's cap capabilities too, just switching on channels and um, having that uh, accessibility there. Um, the other item um, our, our, our subgroup had talked about was uh, the Spare the Air campaign. Um, it actually originates from the Air District and um, quite, you know, this has been around for quite some time and um, hopefully it could be a way that could be modernized, you know, with, in social media that um, why not uh, use something that already exists and um, give it new life and, um, uh, you know, hopefully it, it uh, is something that is catchy and sticks and in people's mind to uh, be aware of 
um, you know, the air quality that day and what they could do to help themselves in their home or um, and uh, from day to day practice. Um, and I think that's all I have. I thought I had something else, but uh, it's, I've lost it now. Um, but thanks for Rhonda to taking down the notes. She, uh, podcast, not iPod, but you know, we, we kind of understood. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> Rhonda, it's podcast, not iPod. <laughs> yeah, podcast. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that is also a, another way of getting out because there are podcasters locally uh, like uh, uh, that reach out to community here as well. And those are, are typically low cost uh, 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 outreach pieces. But thank you for that clarification, that podcast. Yes, thank you. Um, Steve Blanton. Yeah, thanks. Um, on the idea of getting like earlier notification for meetings, I was just going to say from from a staff standpoint, I know we have we have a ton of committee meetings and it's it's very labor intensive to uh, produce those meetings. But one thing we we do is at the beginning of the year, we send out. OK, here's the dates for all of our meetings. We send out uh, like a calendar invite for that. And then as we get closer to the meetings, we actually send out the Zoom info. So sort of, you know, perhaps as a compromise position, the idea of getting this on everybody's calendar, uh, community groups and so forth, if they know the dates, um, they can put it on their calendar. And then as they get the Zoom invitation later, they could add that. So just, just a thought, just a suggestion. Uh, that, that is a good suggestion. I know just for my uh, monthly family Zoom meeting, uh, we set up a 12 month calendar so that they do the dates that were um, that would be coming for uh, the upcoming meetings and uh, and then get the link uh, more closely uh, to that date, the new link for the, the meeting. So, all right, sounds good. Any other comments? Um, I think that this was some great work. Uh, the recommendation, um, do we want to, or are there any thoughts about what priority um, you would see uh, in this? I, and, and Rhonda, uh, I think there was also some uh, discussion as to what communities might be the first one. And in your notes, you had uh, maybe starting with priority one, community mm -hmm. that we had identified as our first priority in the first place. But right. uh, um, let's go ahead and open it up to uh, the public as well for some comment to this. Not and chairs, I'll just note it's about a minute to seven. Okay. If I could give one suggestion. I, I, I like Stephanie's thought on really getting this word out you know, exponentially. You know, if we had a, uh, a website maybe first, then if that could be done in, in, a, in, a, in a short period of time, while we're looking to schedule these, these conversations on TV and radio, then we have something to tell people, well, go here for more information. But I, you know, I really like the idea of getting out there on, on, on you know, Good Day Sacramento, we have local radio stations here in the South area that we can get the word out as well. So I would say from my standpoint, the, the website number one and getting the word out in a, to the broader community would be to Stephanie's point, uh, the second part of that same process. All of that is under, um, I think the media, multimedia, that's number three. And, I guess we're saying we would put it number one. Okay. So, I think it's what Stephanie and I was, would, would suggest. Okay. I, I, I think with that, uh, this is also where we need to look at the other resources that are available to us, such as the Air District's uh, uh, Communications Division, and perhaps some guidance uh, with them. Um, what are some of the options for the surveys to be able to start to reach out to elements of the community to hear their thoughts. I, I know that Adrian uh, Rin put in the chat that they are putting out a survey um, that is going to be talking about the food deserts 
and some of the some of the things uh, that are uh, of concern to community members. So uh, I think just, there's some expertise that may be available to us. Mm -hmm. When it's time for public comment, I'll just note there are a couple public comments in the chat. Yes. Uh, Victoria Vasquez had put into the chat, I don't know if she's still on. Uh, Victoria, what is the benefit of a Zoom link as opposed to a live stream? So- Hi Pat, I'm here, thank you. Okay. I know some of the other communities um, stream their meetings live on Facebook. Uh -huh. That way it's free, it's easy for people to access. They can type questions in the chat there and not have to, you know, find the Zoom link and not have to navigate through Zoom. They can just log into the meeting and see it and it's recorded, they can see it later. So I was just wondering what is the benefit of having a Zoom? Or is like one preferred over the other or is there a reason that we started it this way as opposed to something more accessible? Uh, I, can't, I can't really tell you, I don't know that Facebook Live is recorded um, to, to be able to keep a record or uh, how, how easily, I, I can't really tell you because I don't know um, the, st the streaming, but um, it would seem that potentially both could happen simultaneously, not have to be one or the other. Yeah, Zoom right. meetings can be streamed on Facebook Live. Facebook is proprietary. You need to be a member to participate. So that is one issue. Yeah, right. so maybe I'll just. I, jump I don't in carry a Facebook account anymore that I that I'm active with. I'm I'm kind of opposed to it, so that wouldn't be something I'm doing. Yeah, but others maybe do, just, and that's where they get their information. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, just maybe real quick on that one. You know, some of these are so generally speaking, and I, I want to leave more time for the public if any others questions, comments. Some of these are great questions that we'll go back and touch base with our IT department on as well. Um, you know, some of these things are things we can just look into. So I think some of these, we may not have all the complete answers in terms of like a Facebook Live versus the other. Uh, other than to say, you know, when we were in person, it was sort of a different thing. And then all of a sudden, everyone had to transition very quickly. And so we actually already even went through two different platforms of, before ending up with Zoom sort of being the more typical version. So I would say it's been more of a, a learning and a growing experience for all. Um, and you know, as Pat even just mentioned a moment ago that there's been, um, you know, if we actually have to have a, have a Facebook account, the district doesn't have one. So that may or may not limit. And I don't know the answers to those, but those are things we can follow up on in terms of the recommendations coming from uh, the subgroup. So do we have public comment? Because I know Ariel's telling us that we are at time constraints, so we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, there was just a comment from Adrian. I think um, streaming in addition to Zoom is a great idea and perhaps easier public input during the meeting. Um, were there any other members of the public, if you want to raise your hand, it will either, it'll be under reactions or in participants, depending on your version of Zoom. Victoria, go ahead. Thank you. I think technically I'm a member of the public, but thanks for- Yeah, you are. Think again. Um, and one of the things I had mentioned in the outreach subgroup is that once we gather enough members of the public, I would like for them to tell us, or you know, I would like for them to discuss amongst themselves how they would like to be communicated with or let them weigh in on what's the best platform for them and you know what's the ease of access for them when it comes to things like translation and live streaming or how to access the meeting. So I just wanna make sure that was noted. Yeah, that, that's definitely something we need to know. All right. Um, I'm not, I am not sure that uh, we are ready to, uh, uh, other than the discussion of, of looking at the multimedia and finding some other expert uh, information from our communications um, partners. Um, and then we have to do the follow-up with what it, what, what is a budget to be able to do those, especially for um, if, if we were looking at hiring someone to help us 
be able to have and create a focus campaign. So we need to look at resources that we have and that we are affiliated with and, uh, and come back to, to, to that. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure. It, is anyone entertaining uh, a motion for a priority at this time? Or do we want to come back to that? This is Rhonda. I think there are some things we could probably start, like like uh, contacting um, the, the school districts and parents about the fire uh, hazards. Um, that's just a phone call and ask them to be on their email blast with some kind of uh, flyer or information. You yeah. Know? Um, so there are some things that we could do um, right yeah. now while we're figuring out how to build a website. Um, there's lots of uh, programs um, to build a website pretty easily. Um, I'm sure we could find somebody that can do it. I may know somebody. <laughs> so for little to no cost. So. Maybe we could give direction to the to the subcommittee to 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 take a look at this at this simultaneously as, as having staff take a look at, at, at their resources. Mark and I had a conversation around resources. So maybe you know maybe we do both simultaneously. You know, I, I guess my fear is that one month turns into another month and it's and then all of a sudden you're you're 90 days down the road and right. and we're you know talking about you know, uh, websites. And so I think we could do this, you know, in, in short order and, and, and come back with some recommendations. So I think my recommendation, or I don't know if it's a motion, but my thought process would be, let's all take a look at this website and, you know, put a, you know, maybe we get some information in a 14 day period or, you know, put a deliverable there. And then we, again, we can have something to direct people to mm -hmm. for input and as well as doing you know you know reaching out to schools and, and other things but i still think it's good to have a place for them to go to to get more information okay that one would, thing, that's for for me yeah, sorry just real quick uh one thing we can do in the intervening time and i know we're already um over on this one um but rhonda um, I'll reach back out to you, especially on the immediate fire outreach one. Um, we're already working on some other material as part of some other efforts that we've talked about before uh, in terms of wildfire coordination uh, that Amy is heading up at our agency. So we can share some of the materials we've been developing there. I don't know if it's quite in line with what you guys are thinking or not, but I can share some things that we've already been developing. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be happening, you know, I, I can follow up, you know, this week with you or, you know, the, I and the team can follow up and then we can figure out how best to uh, take advantage of some things we're already working on right now. Okay, that sounds good. A uh, question from here. Oh, just to, uh, in line with Mark's um, comment, um, I think it's great to have something, you know, if it's already in motion that we could, um, just you know, an infographic, a flyer of these are three things you can do to protect yourself during the wildfire season. That's uh, good for public consumption, and you know we could just share it widely um, through all the multimedia outlets. Um, just have it ready made because it's already in progress. Why not use what's already existing and in the works? It, in my mind, I think that's a a good idea. I also think that it's a it's a natural link that will interest people because um, it's a critical issue when, when that fire season is upon us, as well as the idea that you had in it about, you know, what are some of the simple things that you need to do for filtering your air or whatever in your home during those uh, smoke events. So something that can be helpful, but gives us a, a, a way of, of doing initial outreach to, to folks and letting them know that we're here, but right. um, yeah, I uh, I don't want to dictate that. So um, with that, I think we're going to have to move forward, Rhonda. I'll do a follow up with you as well um, with Mark, and then get uh, an email out to everyone about where we can start. We've we've said a few things, but let's let's try to focus in that a little bit tighter and send out 
and get feedback from the committee. Okay. And I especially like to know um, if there's money to offer $5 incentive for people completing the surveys. It's worked for other groups. So we need to find out about the money. Yep. Yes, yes, we do. Yeah, it's, and, and I know a lot of them do a, a gift card. People go into uh, mm -hmm. and are eligible for a gift card. Right. So. But it's really hard to put some meat on the bones of these different recommendations without knowing what kind of money we're working with. Yeah. So, and I, I feel like Bill just said, I don't want to defer this down the road and we still haven't done anything. Yep. So. It's very true. So um, let's move to the next, the next section and, um, and, and run out, I'll, I'll, I'll round back with you on this. Um, but yes, we have to get that information because I am noticing there's a large veil of silence from the district when we start talking about money. So, oh. <laughs> so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to address that. Oh I see that um, Alberto uh, Ayala has raised his his virtual hand. Yeah thank you Pat and again, and again I'll, I'll keep it very quick because I know we need to move along, but I mean, obviously, you know, we're more than happy to provide information in terms of the budgets available for the project. I mean, uh, you know, with the stipends and some of the new projects that Amy talked about, I hope that the committee understands that the district is more than committed to do everything we possibly can to bring whatever funding we can to the community activities. Now, having said that, um, I don't know to what extent um, you have been uh, told that the state has committed in the current state budget the same amount of funding for implementation and incentives for AB 617 as they have in the last two, three years. So it's a bit of a good news story because clearly the governor has made AB 617 um, a, a priority and that includes us. Um, however, um, the other side of that coin is we are disappointed that given the massive surplus that the state is enjoying, that there wasn't more support for AB 617. So that's one of the things that we are advocating for. And unfortunately, um, the implementation funding that we as an air district uh, is expecting to get continues to be probably a little less than half of what it's actually costing us to implement the projects and the program and to continue to work with you. So, mm -hmm. um, Again, it's, 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 it's a bit of a, a mixed bag in terms of um, it's, it's good to see that the governor has, has some funding for this program in South Sacramento and every other community throughout the state, but it is going to be a bit of a pinch for us because, again, it's funded at, at not at the adequate levels that, that we understand is needed. So, um, you know, we have the details. Um, uh, we can provide those to the committee. Like I said, we're basically expecting the same amount of funding as we have been getting over the last two to three years, which is not adequate. We've been telling uh, the governor and the legislature that. So um, I hope that that puts in, in perspective, um, you know, some of the some of the ability that, that we as an air district uh, might be able to have to, to help you with these ideas. We'll do as much as we as, as we can. Uh, and I think having an additional discussion with the subcommittee in terms of maybe pulling out some of the things that are not going to cost us as much, um, uh, maybe that's a, a good way to start. Okay. Okay, let's move forward to the next agenda item, if we can. Um, All right, that's the um, air monitoring. Uh, presentation and, and that really this is a continuation of uh, a discussion we had in, in February on the phase two data. Um, David, are you able to um, go full screen on this one? Um, Click on the bottom. The bottom little uh, screen looked like a movie screen. I am trying to figure out where 
I wanted to see everybody's faces um, when I was oh, that, sharing this information. Yeah, go, to the, go to the display settings right there, uh, David. Yeah, so the... Yeah, and that'll get rid of your second slide. There you go. This you won't right. be able to see faces. Hi, yeah. <laughs> Janice. That won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to figure that out already. It doesn't happen. <laughs> Does this work? Everybody see the slide? It looks big. I'm only seeing off. a part of it. All right. David, why don't you go ahead and um, stop sharing your screen? Oh, okay. there you go. I see it now. There it goes. Oh. It was good. Now it's too big. David, it's zoomed in is the problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on. All right, so um, I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen. Does everybody see my screen? That's it. There Let's it go. is. All right, I can't see anybody's faces. So if you want to uh, stop me for a second, um, feel free to do so, OK? So um, before we get into um, the details um, that Stephen DeAndrea, who is our district statistician, is going to go through, I wanted to review kind of where we are in the project um, to, to help orient us um, in, in trying to understand, you know, what is this information used for and um, and how we're going to use this information moving forward, right? So in the beginning, you know, we, we started the, the community air monitoring plan development in uh, back in 2019, right? And, and we were working with, uh, with you all um, to, you know, figure out what the concerns were, what the monitoring objectives were, and then we moved forward through um, uh, the summer of 2020 to uh, get the community air monitoring plan adopted. In the meantime, we had some low cost sensors up and going because uh, we recognized that, you know, we wanted uh, information, you know, out to the community uh, quicker. So um, as part of our camp, uh, we designed a phase, what we call phase two, is to put out some um, enhanced monitoring sites to get some data to help us make a decision about where to put a full suite of, uh, you know, professional grade, uh, professional grade um, uh, air monitors um, so that we can make a informed decision, right? It's not shooting a, a dart, you know, in the dark. And so we've, you know, we're, we're hitting about, you know, the six months of the phase two data just, just about. And, um, and that's, you know, in the next couple of months or couple in the next month or two, we're going to have more discussions about what the steering committee uh, recommendations are in terms of where, where we should be citing the phase three mobile laboratory. Um, a part of this, and you'll see I have on here is the EPA grant project. Um, if you recall in the community air monitoring plan, we had you know six months of data right for phase two. We recognize that the steering committee really you know wanted to you know see a full year right of of these these six sites, and um, we were able to successfully um, win a grant from the EPA to continue six more months of phase two monitoring in the South Sacramento community. So that's why you see, you know, that we have it extended. Um, you see a little gap there uh, between phase two and, and phase three. Uh, and that's because there's gonna be a, a whole ton of logistics in terms of trying to get a, a trailer out, you know, um, trying to get contracts and things like that. But where I want you to focus on is um, the green box where, um, where after we get a, you know, our, you know, full complete set of data, then that's really when we're able to um, look at the air quality data in, in, in a lot more detail, right? And, and so I, I specifically call that out because I know that there's going to be um, a lot of questions surrounding, you know, what, what sources this might be or where exactly. Um, and really we're, we're, you know, you can see where we are, we're not quite there yet. 
Um, and then at, um, at the end of the day, right, we want to make sure that, you know, we're able to determine what the community pollution levels are and to refine strategies to target, you know, specific source of emissions. Um, and you can see, you know, between that time, there's a lot of time in, in between. And that's where on the bottom you see here is the outreach and the pre-SERP local solution work that, you know, um, Rhonda and, and the group was working on and also um, the discussion that we've had about pre-SERP and, and local solutions. What are some of the things that we can do now? And once we get a full suite of data um, and, and really be able to look at it, then we can go in and refine those strategies and target the emissions. Um, and that's really not, you know, just under the authority of the air district. It is under, you know, um, you know, we talked, uh, Rafe this morning, or not this morning, Rafe earlier talked about, you know, the role of land use, you know, city, city of Sacramento, county of Sacramento, and there's lots more other partners that we can work with to reduce these emissions. Um, so I'll just stop there for a second. I wanted to give kind of a big picture timeline to see where we are um, before I hand it off to Stephen D. Um, any questions about that? I can't see anybody's faces, so. <laughs> okay, all right, hearing none, I'm gonna introduce uh, Stephen D'Andrea. He's our district statistician, and he's gonna do a, um, a review on, you know, what we saw in phase one, what we saw, what we're seeing in phase two, um, and I'll let him get into that. So go ahead, Stephen, I'll pass it on to you. Hi, thanks, Janice. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, it's nice to see a few familiar faces here. It's been a, it's been a little while since I've been in front of the steering committee. So it's nice to, uh, nice to see some familiar and some new faces. It's great. Um, so like Jenna said, um, hi. Uh, I'm the, the, the district statistician and um, I've been fortunate enough actually to have the opportunity to work on 617 since really the legislation passed almost four years ago now. Um, I've also been uh, involved throughout the community selection process, development of the camp, and now into the data analysis part two. So I'm pretty excited to present some of this preliminary data that we've found from our phase two of the air monitoring plan. Uh, so the air monitoring plan in our community involves a three phase approach with um, more detailed measurements essentially from phase to phase. So phase one involved deployment of 22 low cost sensors uh, phase two, as Janice mentioned, where we currently are, we've deployed six standalone monitors uh, into the community. And in phase three upcoming, a mobile laboratory will be deployed into the community. Next slide. So as a recap, uh, here's a summary of the phase one PM 2.5 monitoring. Uh, so just as uh, um, sort of rehash, uh, PM 2.5 refers to fine particles, generally two and a half microns or so or smaller. Um, these particles are about 30 times smaller than the width of a human hair. Um, then they're very, very common particles in smoke, traffic emissions, and sometimes dust. Um, 22 low cost uh, sensors, PM2.5 sensors were deployed at 21 sites throughout the community uh, at locations that were specifically chosen by the committee to capture concentrations that could have, um, that could have real impacts on community residents for their day-to-day -day life and health. So as particle sensors become um, more accurate and more, more importantly, accessible, uh, a dense network of sens sensors such as this really becomes possible. So this helps to increase the air quality awareness as the data is available in near real time, which can be found um, for the community uh, on the district website that's actually the link at the, the bottom of this slide. So from the data collected in phase one, what can be seen in the plot here is that the average concentrations for each of the priority areas were pretty consistent with each other. So in general, they had fairly similar, le similar levels, uh, except for the days with loads of wildfire smoke in the late summer or early fall of last year, which I'm sure everyone, uh, everyone remembers those days. Next slide. So this brings me to phase two, which includes some more detailed air monitoring. Uh, phase two monitoring has been underway since last summer and it's taking place at six sites that are all shown on the map here. Um, these six sites are all located within the four um, community identified and approved priority areas. Um, the monitors cover a wide variety of land use from industrial to near road to residential and 
and they even we even have them on both sides of, the, of Highway 99 and close to rail tracks. Um, these phase two sites are measuring toxic metals as discussed back in February's meeting, as well as toxic gases. So specifically VOCs or volatile organic compounds, but I'll talk about those uh, in, a, in an upcoming slide, as well as black carbon. The purpose of these measurements is to help identify a location for our phase three mobile laboratory with a whole suite of instruments um, that I sort of mentioned back at the, I think the first slide. Next slide. So here is a recap of the preliminary results from the phase two toxic metal measurements. Um, however, before I touch on the results, I just wanna remind everyone that the pollutants that we're talking about throughout this presentation are pollutants that generally exist in ambient air in very small concentrations in virtually all urban environments. Um, the metals and VOCs that I'm gonna talk about next that were measured in phase two are not all necessarily considered toxic. Uh, some are helpful um, and important to identify types of emission sources, such as calcium and iron are, are two good examples. And some are emitted naturally from vegetation, wildfires or sometimes even volcanoes. So with that context in mind, uh, here's a recap of the preliminary results from the phase two uh, toxic metals measurements. The, uh, the VFW post and impact church sites had one measurement which exceeded the 24 hour federal standard for PM 2.5 of 35 micrograms and no sites measured above the health standard for lead. The VFW post site was found to have measured the highest average concentration for PM 2.5 and most metals. Next slide. So this brings me on to the next group of pollutants from the phase two monitoring that I wanna discuss uh, some of our preliminary findings. Uh, these are toxic gases or more specifically VOCs. So VOCs or volatile organic compounds are a category of hundreds of different gaseous air pollutants, which come from natural as well as human produced sources. So um, some VOCs have known health, um, adverse health effects, while others do not. Uh, VOCs are by and large regulated by local, state and federal regulations. And especially here in Sacramento County, we have a pretty good grasp on VOC emissions through our permitting operations. Uh, the phase two monitors that we have deployed are intended to provide us with additional information to help with locating for, location for our uh, phase three mobile monitor. Next slide. So here's just some examples of some of the more well-known VOCs you may or may not have heard of. Um, benzene, which can be emitted from gas stations and given off burning cigarettes. Uh, methylene chloride, which can come from hairspray and paint strippers. And xylene, which is also found in paints, inks, and adhesives. Um, exposure to these VOCs and other toxic VOCs can cause short-term and, and long-term health effects. And uh, some of them I just, I've listed here. Next slide. So the toxic VOC data that I'm gonna talk about uh, today are preliminary results from nearly 20,000 lines of data. Uh, the samples that were collected are basically, to give you an idea of what they are, they're essentially just metal cans that suck in a bunch of air over the course of 24 hours. We seal them up, then ship them off to a lab, and the lab analyzes uh, for the different VOCs of the concentrations. Uh, we analyzed data from 117 unique pollutants over 24 sample days, spanning August 2020 through the end of February 2021. Uh, this totaled 124 valid samples that were sent off to the lab. Um, in the data, we saw elevated concentrations due to uh, statewide wildfire impacts near the end of the summer last year that I, I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, for each pollutant in site, we calculated the highest average concentration and the maximum concentration. Next slide. So the preliminary findings um, are that the VFW post and impact church sites were found to have the greatest number of highest concentrations. These are the, the two star stars that are shown on the map, that red and the, and the black one. When the wildfire days were excluded, the VFW post site was found to have the greatest number. Next slide. So next I would like to just quickly discuss some preliminary findings uh, in our black carbon data from the phase two sites. So black carbon is essentially exactly what it sounds like. It's just very dark particles that are emitted from stuff burning. So black carbon makes up uh, part of the PM 2.5 concentrations that we measure and can primarily be emitted from cars, trucks, forest fires, fireplaces, and other combustion sources. Next slide. So here's a graph of weekly average black carbon concentrations from our phase two sites. So the colored lines that you see on the graph here are the sensors that are deployed out in our community. And the black dashed line is the one from our permanent regulatory site that's located at uh, Del Paso Manor 
elementary school in around the Arden Arcade area. Uh, note that also that there are two lines for Station 56, which is located in the northwest part of the community near Franklin and 47th. That's, I put a little tiny map there to kind of see what it looks like or where it is. Uh, there was an issue with the sensor. Um, we worked with the manufacturer to deploy a replacement for that one. And one other thing to note too, is that there was a sensor deployed at Florin Elementary, but also due to malfunction, that data was not included in this chart. Next slide. So the preliminary conclusions that we could draw from this data is that at the Station 56 site, the one that, I, that I showed you in the Northwest portion of the community, uh, it tended to be slightly higher than all the other sites. So in particular, it was highest in August and September of 2020. The full reasoning behind this needs further investigation. However, a very important conclusion is that for the most part, all the stations tend to track all the ups and downs with each other quite well. So and that's also including at our, our permanent station at Del Paso Manor. So this is usually the case that we have seen historically that the regular data tracks very well with each other. So it's actually a really good sign that the sensors are functioning properly and are capturing the general black carbon levels that tend to be widespread across the county. So good sign. Next slide. So in summary, uh, the preliminary data shows that for phase one, based on that dense network of low cost sensors, all sites tended to measure similar concentrations except for days with those wild, uh, the widespread wildfire impacts. Uh, those all of the uh, phase one monitors are shown on the map as orange dots. And for phase two, uh, station 56, the green star on the map, tended to have the highest weekly average concentrations of black carbon. And VFW post, which is the red star on the map, measured the greatest number of highest concentrations for PM 2.5, toxic metal, and VOCs. So the rest of the phase two monitoring sites are shown on the map also. I just put them on as gray dots. So the next steps for in our air monitoring are for recommendations for placement of our phase three mobile laboratory. So for, I guess, continued discussion on this, I'm just gonna pass it back over to Janice to finish up with the presentation. And I'd just like to, to thank you all for your time and attention. And our team and I would be happy to entertain any questions you have at the, at the end. Great, thank you, uh, Stephen, for, um, for the recap and the, uh, the phase two data. Um, I guess maybe before we, well, I see Vincent has his hand up, so I'm going to go ahead and stop share my screen so I can see you. <laughs> um, Vincent, did you have a question specifically right now? I can't I hear you. Can we go back to the graph and look at the, uh, the chart? Uh, the pictures were all nice, but the, the graph kind of showed everybody what, what we the data from the monitors. So Vincent, we'll pull it, we'll go back to that graph. Just to be clear though, that graph was only for black carbon. Right. The graph was not for the toxic metals or the toxic VOCs. Right, so the question I had was the extreme difference here in uh, September and August and September for the station 56 site and so so it had an extremely, a lot more black carbon than any other site I noticed. Mm -hmm. So can yeah. we get an explanation for any of that or, or, or any of the days? And then the other question I had was for the VFW site on its worst day for uh, PM 2.5. Do we have a PM 2.5 chart like this for all the different monitors? So, so let me answer your question, I think, backwards. <laughs> um, the VFW site does not specifically have a PM 2.5 monitor there. Um, it does have uh, the black, black carbon. Um, and you can see that uh, on this chart under in, in the red line. And so, um, so we, you know, that's, that's, that's how, you know, I think you can do the comparison for that. Um, in terms of your question about uh, the higher levels of um, black carbon at station 56, uh, that's difficult to say right now. I think that needs further investigation on our part. There could be a whole slew of reasons for that. And um, we're, we're not at this point um, 
able to uh, draw a conclusion on specifically why um, it's reading as high. It could range from, you know, something's going on with the analyzer and, or it could range from, you know, there might be an emission. So I think right now I can't answer that question um, as early as I think uh, you're hoping. And if so, I may just expand upon that real quick for your benefit, Vincent, um, this is actually a question that, the, um, as Janice mentioned at the very beginning, you know, we are able to go even longer on our phase two study, uh, thanks to the EPA grant. And that will also then include some additional analysis at the end when we have the full year of data. And that's actually already one of the questions that we've been posing um, with the contracting company that's helping us with some of that EPA study is that question of like, well, what might be possible reasons for a higher black carbon, especially during that specific time frame? You know, what would be different? You know, so those are some questions we're asking as well, Vincent. Okay, good. Because I've been dry, I drive by that site all the time and I take pictures frequently of all the smoke that comes out of the smud cogeneration plant. And uh, when we were talking about it a few months ago, you guys said because our the smokestacks are a hundred feet in the air, this, it goes, the steam goes up and drifts far away. Well, I've been taking pictures of it where it doesn't go up and drift away. So certain weather conditions and weather patterns don't allow that steam to go up. And, and some days the steam is gray and some days it's black. So just that's why I happened to ask about that particular station. And I have the pictures and they're dated if you want me to. I, I was going to send them to you. Maybe we can just look at them and compare them to the data on our uh, chart to see if they coincide with the days that black smoke comes out of those uh, smokestacks and drifts downward, not upward. So I have one more question and I'll be done. So in our original chart of the sites, it listed the VFW as the PM 2.5 highest one and the other, uh, the Unity Church location, but you guys didn't mention the uh, the 56 station or also known as smud cogeneration plant location. So I was just wondering why we didn't include all three of those. And we were talking about the worst sites of uh, the phase two monitors. Well, it's phase two and phase one, or I don't know. It looks like it was the worst one out of all of them to me. So uh, just real quick and Jance, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this one. Uh, the station 56 was the high for black carbon. And so it was actually flagged on the, the table for black carbon. The PM 2.5 that Janice re, uh, was referencing was from the phase two where we actually had the filter weighing, um, which was VFW post. And VFW post then was the high as well for the metals and the VOC. So 56 was listed for the black carbon. So I don't, okay. so it, it was listed for black carbon on that, or um, if we had it back up on the screen at the moment. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay. All right. Okay, there. Now I guess it's the winner there, or the worst is the winner of this condition. Thank you. Great. All right, I'm going to move to um, some discussions and observations on our part. And Stephen uh, went through some of the, the data portion of it. Um, but before we get into that, I wanted to make a couple of points. Um, one is that you know monitoring and analysis is um, going to be an ongoing process for us, and so um, you know as we mentioned earlier, you know we are still even getting um, the EPA grant, and um, we're extending that monitoring for an additional six months. So for you know there's going to be more data and more information to come at all six locations. Um, and, and as we're getting this information in, we'll be, um, we'll be doing you know, analysis and, and trying to understand that uh, a little bit better. Um, and the next thing, I, the next point I wanted to make was about location recommendations. And um, you know, part of this discussion in the next you know, month or, or two is you know, where are we going to, with this information that we got, where are we going to, um, Put the uh, where are we going to you know hope to aim to put the mobile laboratory and I want to you know provide some reassurance to the committee that you know this you know the the recommendations that we're going to be providing and you know hopefully in the next couple months that it can be revisited um, after you know after we 
uh, place the monitor um, after, you know, you know, six or plus months of uh, monitoring plus, you know, any time for us to do any data review. So this is really a, um, an ongoing process. And we're, um, so, you know, it's not the end all be all. I think that's the, 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 the point that I'm trying to make. Um, so I wanted to provide um, these couple of points uh, as we're having this discussion. So this next slide here just quickly shows um, the phase three monitoring, um, what the mobile laboratory will be monitoring for. I'm not gonna read them all out, um, but here's the list that you've seen before. So there's three things that, you know, um, that we specifically, you know, observed about the data. Um, one is that it's very consistent with the steering committee's uh, recommendation in terms of area of concern. Uh, pri priority area one, as Stephen was sharing earlier today, tends to see, tend to be where we're seeing our higher concentrations of, uh, of toxics, right? And sampling for toxics was generally higher um, at the VFW post site, which is, you know, in the central part of the community. Uh, the data that we saw um, from both, you know, phase one, phase two, uh, you know, near the freeway is where we're, we're, we tend to see the higher concentrations and um, especially in phase two, where we see it's within, you know, within like a half a mile of the freeway. So I think that that really, um, I think confirms some of the discussions that the steering committee had early on about, um, uh, about you know, any potential of uh, tra traffic, you know, emissions. Um, and so, you know, how, how do we think about where do we put the phase, you know, wh what questions should we be asking um, ourselves uh, when we're thinking about where to place, you know, the, the, the mobile laboratory? And some of the questions that we ask ourselves all the time, even, you know, when we're citing for, uh, you know, our regulatory monitoring sites, you know, the, there's a question of, you know, do we monitor where we see the highest readings? Or do you monitor closer to where people, you know, live and play? And typically, you know, we do monitor at where we see the highest readings. Um, and so, uh, you know, the next question we were thinking about is, you know, do we, because we're seeing this trend of higher concentrations of, um, a, you know, near the freeway, do we want to go too far from the freeway? Do we want to, um, or do we want to be closer? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we saw higher concentrations within a half a mile of the freeway. Um, but, you know, if you move a little bit east to, from the VFW post, you have a little, um, I think you have uh, some residential areas um, in that area as well. And so for area, uh, so for us, you know, for area one, you know, is it, do we want to monitor, you know, closer to the VFW or closer to the Northern, you know, area where you're seeing the, the higher black carbon for the station 56. And part of that um, question, you know, part of that is like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's, it's more, you know, it's more about, you know, where typically, you know, are we seeing the highest readings? And when we first designed this, um, the when we first designed the monitoring um, uh, strategy, we were hoping to use phase two to inform phase three. You know, we wanted to see where the highest reading was. So that those are you know some of the things that you know we we've thought of and um, would likely make that recommendation. Um, but with that said, you know, I know that there may be other things that the steering committee would like, you know, would like to consider, you know, agree, disagree. Um, but, you know, I, I'm going to stop my screen sharing for just a second so I can see everybody. Um, if there's, you know, any other thoughts um, with locating the mobile laboratory, it's not as simple, you know, we have to still find a site. Right. So we're so what I would like from the steering committee is, you know, maybe some parameters, you know, um, because, you know, 
telling me or, uh, you know, giving very specifics may, may not um, be, uh, be as feasible depending on, you know, just where we can work with property owners and whatnot. And chairs, it just might be helpful to get a sense of your preferred timing um, on this item before we, we move to public comment and the new business, because we're Ariel, running a little may, late. Ariel, if you may real quick, just also to remind everyone, we're not actually looking for a specific recommendation tonight. Mm -hmm. So we weren't just sharing data and then looking for an answer in the next five minutes. Um, this is something we were definitely planning on coming back, talking with the group again next month um, as needed, or, or even a little bit longer if you guys need the time but we want to start the, the questions now. So we're not looking for an answer tonight, just so people don't have to feel rushed or pressured. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Any comment? Uh, I have a comment. Uh, uh, I, I am happy that uh, our awareness of the community, we had identified what we thought were some of the highest priority areas, and now the data is coming through showing that. Uh, in the Station 56 area, that also has a very large distribution center, a lot of diesel truck traffic that comes out of there. So that is a, a place we anticipated also having high levels of uh, black carbon potentially. Uh, I think when we look at um, the placement of phase three, one of the things I would want to consider is placing it, if at all possible, where we have particularly sensitive populations. And right near Station 56, we have an elementary school. Um, and then just on the other side of Franklin, we also have uh, elementary schools with uh, Chacon uh, uh, Science and Language. Uh, we have, uh, I don't know what the elementary school is just on the other side of the tracks uh, from uh, Station 56 also is right in that area. Um, but perhaps those are some of the things, the same thing with the VFW. We have residential areas. We have Cootie Drive off of Franklin Boulevard. Uh, we have residential areas and I think we have to get a sense of what's happening at that level, uh, at, at our most sensitive population levels too, and not just be at, at uh, a location where we don't have sensitive group necessarily centered at that location. Uh, I see Vincent has a comment, thank you. Go ahead, Vincent. Vincent, you're on mute. Mute. Sorry. <laughs> I think you touched on it, Pat. And uh, the uh, the Franklin Boulevard area has a lot of different transitional living. A Paul Bunyan Hotel is is converted into a a, a transitional yeah. living home, and this is full to capacity. And so there's a lot of uh, communities in that area that that are, are getting this black carbon smoke, which is included in the PM 2.5, right? Correct. Correct. And so I would just, uh, I think you hit on, it, on the, everything I was gonna say. Thank you, Pat. Any other comments from members? All right, can we take those comments from the public quickly as well? Once again, members of the public, if you want to raise your hand virtually it's in reactions or in participants. All right. I don't see any hands at this point. All right. I don't think I missed any. Okay. Um, well, thank you for this first uh, draft of uh, this preliminary information. Uh, and, ooh, yeah, <laughs> we, have, we have work to do. And I believe as well, when we're talking about going back to our prior discussion, this is the community. This does look like the community that we need to have the priority outreach to to start those community discussions um, as well. So I, I think that that has identified 
uh, where we where we need to go first. Uh, Bill, do you want to move forward? Uh, I've lost Bill. Let's move forward to. Uh, no, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I didn't <clears throat> didn't take myself off mute. Go go ahead. Um, shall we move forward to our new business because yes. we're almost out of time? Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, our next item is a uh, new business and future agenda topics. Uh, we do have uh, Trish Johnson from, uh, or is it, uh, I don't know, Trish or Deldi um, from CARB who's going to be uh, providing some information about the new community air grant opportunity this year. Trish will be uh, giving us an update. Okay. Thanks, Deldi and Janice. Good evening. This is uh, Trish Johnson. I work in the environmental justice section at CARB. Um, and we do... Um, work with the community air grant program. And so in Sacramento, uh, Valley Vision uh, was an awardee for the last um, solicitation that was um, first sent out in the summer of 2019. So I guess about two years ago now, and they were awarded at the very end of 2019. Um, and so what I just wanted to briefly present was that, um, uh, at the very, very beginning of this month, we released a timeline. I did drop a link in the chat to say that um, actually tomorrow we happen to be having a workshop and releasing our draft um, solicitation, I'll call it for short, so that folks can take a look at it for themselves. We do have a, a two week um, window where we hope that folks will you know, take a look through the materials, send us an email if you have questions or comment. And then we're working to uh, finalize that and release the final um, on July 2nd. That's part of our timeline. And we also identified a series of different um, workshops and events throughout the application window, which right now is 90 days. So that would put the um, application deadline of October 1st. And I do expect, you know, um, some of these dates and timelines to be discussed at our workshop tomorrow, which we will record and post to our website. Um, so if there's any changes, we will update this timeline. But um, just wanted to let you know that, that this was coming. And um, I look forward to hearing from any of you if you have uh, questions about a community air grant project. Very good. Thank you, Trish. Uh, Marita, uh, can we make sure that we send that uh, link out to all the members as well so that we can share it across our community um, uh, relations uh, if, if anyone is interested in that? Absolutely. Yeah, I can send that out tomorrow. Thank you. All right, Janice, or do we have another item on that future? We do. Um, so uh, our, our next um, meeting is on June twenty second, and uh, we have a you know we have a couple of uh, items that um, we think will be relevant uh, to discuss next meeting. Um, we you know we you heard a you know some discussion today about the phase relocation. We want to continue that discussion uh, next month. Um, and as part of um, as part of you know uh, that discussion, or as part as a part of the separate discussion, <laughs> um, we want to also have uh, to give a you know AB six seventeen budget update. And you know we recently just uh, are working on you know we recently heard from CARB about the allocations and Alberto touched a little bit about this already. And so we'll be coming back um, this next month uh, to, to provide an update on, on that. With that said, you know, I heard a couple of other things um, that uh, during this meeting, you know, one was about outreach, um, further discussions about that. And then you can see that um, some of these other items we've uh, we've listed in the past as well as before. Um, but I wanted to see, you know, 
what what folks thoughts were about this um the proposed agenda items i just wanted to note too there's been a hearty discussion going on in the chat about getting a steering committee letter related to funding for ab 617 and alberto i don't know if that's something that needs to come back or if that's something that would be offline um I think we can we can treat it offline because, as you know, the governor and the legislature are making decisions on the state budget, and they are going to finalize it within the next couple of weeks. So um, I welcome the interest from many of the steering committee members. Uh, luckily, we've been working on on some of these letters, so we have a sample on hand that I think we can readily modify and share with you. Uh, so if the chairs and the committee is in agreement, we can take this offline and help you with the information that we've been. Uh, chatting about it. That sounds good. That sounds good to me. Um, and if that can be done at, as quickly as possible, Alberto, so that we could have it be effective, uh, uh, even at this late hour in the process. I commit to doing that, Pat. Um, I'm literally, as we speak, uh, texting with our lobbyists. So as soon as we get some feedback on the letter, we'd be more than happy to share with you all. Very good. Um, the other the other piece, uh, as far as what CARB's uh, uh, grant uh, is, could we not participate in that as uh, one, our, our own group looking at that grant, and two, uh, more importantly, working in partnership with others in the community who may be looking uh, to to uh, build an opportunity with that grant, with the AIR grant. It has some levels of flexibility that we absolutely do not have um, under, uh, strictly under the, our AB 617, including funding some consultants that we don't have. Uh, so that may be a possibility as well. Okay. I'll, I'll shoot a note to Trish. <laughs> Find out if that. Um, all right. Uh, any other uh, opportunities? Oh, wait, Janice, you, you asked for a recommendation, didn't you? <laughs> what we would want on our uh, uh, agenda. We definitely have to come back uh, because I think we must move on our outreach uh, uh, component. Uh, we're definitely going to have to have a follow-up to that. Um, I would very much like to hear about the, uh, the uh, urban heat islands, but that's me. Um, so any other ideas off of off that budget? We need, we need to understand our budget as well. Uh, I have a question. Yes. In the chat, I had asked Adrian if he could give us a report on what their uh, $5 online survey looked like and as well as the results, was it effective and stuff? So I was wondering if we could ask Adrian to, uh, if possible, to give us a report on that, how effective it was and, and We'll get an idea. What does it cost? I know the Native American Health Center had 300 uh, people respond within two days and they completed all their questions. And so that's just a simple, easy survey. Yep. Can we, can we ask Adrian if he could report to us? Uh, Would you be willing, Adrian? I don't know if Adrian is still on. Are you there, Adrian? No, no I'm here. here. I'm happy to do that. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Adrian. That, that could be a, a quick report back that, that helps ha ha what your success rate has been. All right. Uh, any other recommendations for next month's agenda? All right, at that point, Bill, I'll turn it over to you. We can do a wrap. Well, again, as, as always, uh, from, from all of us to all of you and the public, again, <laughs> I know this can get dry, and it, but it, this Folks, is we, we do need to check to see if there are uh, general public comments. Oh, I thought we did. I'm, I apologize. Go right ahead. <laughs> Any general public comments? 
And if so, we're looking for raised hands. Handing it back to you, Bill. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for spending uh, part of your evening with, with us. We know how difficult it is to, to balance family and work and commitments and committees. So uh, again, thank you so much for, for all that you do. Staff, uh, what you do is, is so important and the work that you do for us, uh, if we don't say thank you enough, uh, please know that we appreciate all of your hard work behind the scenes. So good night, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Have a safe uh, Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully you get a little longer uh, an extra day off or so. Mm -hmm. Be safe. Be safe. Right. Yeah. All right. Good night, everyone. Good, good night, night, everyone. Thank good you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night. All right. All right. I'm going to good stop night. the recording.